All right, today I'm going to be teaching you about Satan. Uh, might be a reminder for some of you. Um, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about Satan in the world. Um, so I want to dispel some of those myths and we can look at um, what the Bible tells us about Satan. Uh, you know, there definitely is a spiritual realm. You don't have to read too far into the Bible or, you know, even in the New Testament where there is, there is a spiritual realm where there is angels and there are demons and, you know, things that go bump in the night. But, you know, we don't have to be scared of these things because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But we don't have to be ignorant that these things exist. You know, there is a supernatural aspect to this world and some people want to just, you know, naturalize everything and everything's just an explanation naturalistically, but... That's not the case. There is a spiritual realm. There is a Satan. There are spiritual beings that you cannot necessarily see, but, you know, affect the physical realm. So we're going to talk a bit about Satan uh, today and potentially next week as well. 2 Corinthians 2, the Bible says here, For to this end also did I write, that I may know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So we don't want Satan to get the upper hand on us, like it's saying here, because we don't want to be ignorant of who he is and how he operates. So that's part of the reason why I'm preaching this sermon today. We should know a bit about Satan. It's like I said, there's a lot of misconceptions about Satan. But the Bible has a lot to say about Satan. So we don't really have an excuse to be ignorant about Satan. People only don't know about Satan because they're not looking at their Bible to see what the Bible has about Satan. So maybe when we go through these, you can think to yourself, oh, how many misconceptions about Satan do I have? as we go through some of the facts or the truth about Satan. Now the first thing we're going to look at is where we started in Ezekiel 28. Let's look at Satan's origin. Satan's origin. So Satan has an origin. He is not an eternal being. Some people believe, and the world you know, teaches, like in pagan mythology and that, that there is a good God and then there is a bad God. There is a good God who is reigning in heaven, and he's white. He looks like Gandalf, you know, long beard, white robes. And then you have Satan in hell, who's like in a bread jumpsuit, you know, with a pitchfork. Um, and they're kind of like opposites, like the yin and yang. No, no, that's not the case. Satan has a beginning. He is a creature. He is a created creature, right? And he is a creature that was created by God, believe it or not. That God created satan right now obviously satan has rebelled against god and become something that god did not intend but yet god allows him to operate for his purposes but in ezekiel 28 we see here a passage about some kings right the prince of tyrus but as you read through these passages you know that they're not just talking about these kings because there are things that don't apply to these kings so these are prophetical passages that are talking about Satan and things that are going to happen to Satan. And as we read through it, you can see. But in this passage in Ezekiel 28, we learn about, a lot about Satan. So the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord. So even though he's preaching against the prince of Tyrus, in his preaching, and a lot of Old Testament preaching is like this, there are things being alluded to that are not necessarily about the person being preached. How do you think, just think about even like with end times prophecy, even with salvation, you know, there's, there's allusions to the new covenant, even in Old Testament preaching, but even the prophecies about Jesus. You know, think about the prophecies about Jesus. I mean, you, you'd read the Old Testament, you'd have no idea that that was talking about Jesus, but the only reason why you know is because in the New Testament it says, oh, well, that's actually talking about Jesus. That psalm is talking about Jesus. That passage in Micah is talking about Jesus. So some of them are a bit more obvious than others. But, you know, don't be surprised when, you know, you have an Old Testament passage. Old Testament passages are a little bit darker. That's why they're always interpreted in light of the New Testament, because the New Testament sheds light on these Old Testament passages that have multiple meanings to them. 
Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord, because thine heart is lifted up. So I want you to just reflect on some of these characteristics of Satan because, you know, we want to be like Jesus Christ. We don't want to be like Satan. So when we see Satan, we think that's a bad example. We shouldn't be like this. But we want to be like Jesus Christ. So one thing is, Satan is proud, isn't he? That's one of the reasons. Pride cometh before a fall. And Satan is like the perfect example of pride coming before a fall because he was proud, his heart was lifted up, and that's what caused him to sin against God. Thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God. See, he wants to be a God. Notice here he's saying, I must be a God with a capital letter G. You know, he wants to be God. Now, he knows he can't be God. That's why he wants to be like the Most High in Isaiah 14. But his pride is he wants to be his own God. And this is why that's a satanic thought today that people want to be their own God. They want to be their, you know, they chart their own destiny. You know, I believe it, I name it, I claim it. You know, I can like control the universe with my positive thoughts. Like this whole idea of just being God as opposed to us being creatures is subject to a God and knowing our place in the universe. In the universe. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a man. So you see that there's a bit of both, where you know, it's talking about this prince, he's lifted up, he wants to be like God, like many. He's saying, Thou art a man, but obviously, Satan is not a man, right? But you can see the prophecy going back and forth there. And not God. Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God, you know, you want to be God. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. You know, this is why, you know, you don't want to mess with this occultic stuff. You know, people through curiosity, they start doing the Ouija boards and all these seances and, and you know, and they're just curious and they think that they can, they're, they're more powerful than the spirits. You know, you don't want to mess with this stuff because Satan is not silly. You know, he says he's wiser than Daniel. Now, that's a compliment to Daniel. But to say, hey, Satan is even wiser than Daniel. Daniel is obviously very, uh, one of the wise men in Babylon. But Satan is very smart. You know, he's not silly. He knows what he's doing. And this is why, you know, he's the God, the God of this world, the one that's running, you know, sort of pulling the strings in the background, trying to influence this world. You can see Satan's influence in the world. He's very smart at how he, how he does this. There is no secret that they can hide from thee with thy wisdom. See, he's wise. With thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. You see how Satan is a very smart creature. And by being smart, he knows how to influence the world. He understands economics, right? He understands how riches are got, you know, whether it's through, you know, just through capitalist means or either just through dictatorial means, you know, through threats and like the way the mafia might work. Has gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. So he's a very rich creature, and rich in very things. He can offer people a lot of things if they worship him. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic, thou hast, hast thou increased thy riches and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. You see how riches can cause a person to be proud, cause a person to be rebellious of God. Not that riches are necessarily bad in and of themselves, but they have a danger there. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom. So this is now a judgment against the king of Tyrus, but it's God saying that Satan one day will be judged. Against the beauty of thy wisdom. So notice, there's a lot of like worldly themes coming through with Satan. Pride, riches, you know, the materialism, the covetousness, and now the beauty, right? The, the vainness of beauty. Of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. So what is that talking about? We're going to see that later in Revelation. <coughs> Satan is going to go to the same place where... Um, Unbelievers go to die for all eternity in hell. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am a God? I, I, I am God? So he's saying like when you are burning in hell, 
Are you going to look to God and say, I'm God? Right? That's the same sort of attitude like the atheists that they want to control their own, they don't want anything to do with God. Are they going to be saying that when they're in hell, being tormented day and night forever and ever? They're not. That's why it's, it's going to humble them. Thou shalt be a man and know God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers. So you see how he's going to experience the same thing as the unbeliever will experience. The wages of sin is death. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. So that's one prophecy. Look at the second one. So the second one gives us even more insight into Satan. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So there's that wisdom again. Right? He's very wise, he's very smart. That beauty, he understands beauty. But look, this is what I'm saying. This is how you know it's not just talking about the king of Tyrus. Thou hast been in Eden. Now, was the king of Tyrus in Eden? No. But we learn here, Satan was in Eden. We know he was in Eden because he was the one that tempted Eve. But now we know he fell, well, he rebelled against God. When I say fell, it means he sinned because he was created perfect. He sinned against God prior to man's fall. Right? So obviously, Satan was created he fell, he sinned against God, and then he went to go, you know, deceive Eve. Thou hast been in, the, in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. So you see how he's very beautiful, beautiful. Like, you know, he's using the analogy here of like jewelry, like jewelry is used to beautify a lady. It says here, he, he as well has like these stones to make him beautiful. The sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. So notice here as well, we've got pride, we've got beauty. I mean, doesn't this just describe the, the, the ways of the world? We've got the riches, right? And now we've got what? The music. See, so Satan is a musical creature as well, and he influences the world through the music of the world. Right, so God has his music, Satan has his music. Right? And we know what that type of music is because it's the worldly music. It's the music that's talking about materialism. It's the music that's talking about fornication. It's the music that's talking about pride. It's the music that's talking about you know, humanism and you know, blaspheming God and all these sorts of things. That's, that's the world's music. That's Satan's influence in the music. He's a musical creature. You know, even as like some musicians, they claim to have gotten their abilities from Satan. You know, by worshiping Satan, making deals with the devil, you know, getting that ability. In the day that thou wast created. So you see how Satan has an origin. He's not an eternal being. He's not everywhere at once. He's a created being that is in one place at one time. And that's why Satan's not all over the world tempting everyone. His influence is... You know, and his demons are out there influencing, but he's not the opposite of God. God is the only one that is omnipotent, outside his creation, omniscient, omnipresent. Satan is not. Right? He was created by God. He was created here. Thou art the anointed cherub. So that's what Satan is. He's a cherub. We'll talk about that later. That cover, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. See, this is, not the, this is not the king of Tyrus. This is Satan. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So notice how he was created perfect, right? And then he sinned against God and then became, you know, Satan, right? And led the charge against God. Obviously, God allows it for a reason, but... That's not why he was created. So when people say, why did God create Satan? Well, God didn't create Satan the way we think of Satan now. God created Satan perfect to worship God, to glorify God, like he created man. But Satan has a free will as well, and he used that free will to sin against God. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they filled the midst of thee with violence. Now is sin, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. And so now this is talking about Satan actually being cast out of heaven. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. <coughs> thou hast corrupted thy wisdom 
by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Isn't that a sad thing? And we see that in the world where God blesses a creature with talents and abilities and beauty. And yet that wisdom, that talent, that beauty causes people to be pride, prideful and go away from God and serve themselves rather than serve God. You say, like Satan, such a look, a look, a wicked creature, look at what he did. And yet, us in the flesh do that same thing. Right? So we can see this in Satan. We, we should not be like that when we look at Satan. And yet, we see elements of Satan in ourselves. Isn't it no wonder when the Bible talks about the child of God and the child of the devil? Right? Because that's what the devil is like, is the fleshly, self serving, using the abilities that God has given him for their own, his own good as opposed to glorifying God. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries. Look at this. By the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. He's got sanctuaries. See how Satan is also a religious creature as well. He has his religion. Right? Therefore I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. So Ezekiel 28 gives us a lot of insight into um, Satan. Now, like I said, he was created perfect. He sinned against God, then he went to tempt Eve. So we know that he was in the garden, like it says in Ezekiel 28, in Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So now in Ezekiel 28, we learn about the history of Satan prior to even, you know, this event in Genesis 3. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So, there's a lot I can talk about here, but I don't want to spend too much time on this story with Eve, but we can see here that she is ignorant of God's word. I mean, she didn't even know the name of the tree, which is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in the midst of the garden. She's like, oh, there's this tree that's kind of in the midst, you know. That reminds me of when people say, yeah, the Bible is, it's like, I know it says it in there somewhere, you know, and then they misquote it. They don't really know what the Bible says. It's like Eve. You see how like that, that ignorance can lead you into taking up the wrong view or being deceived by, you know, the influence of Satan. Because this is what happened with Eve. Eve didn't know God's word. Eve had just a general idea. She says, like, ah, oh, it's the tree in the midst of the garden. And then she says, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, did God say you can't touch the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? No. So she, now she's adding things to God's word. So she doesn't know God's word. So when Satan comes to her and says, yea, hath God said, She's not confident in knowing God's word. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. So now he's just blatantly denying God's word. For God doth know in that day ye eat thereof. Then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband <laughs> with her, <coughs> and he did eat. So you see how Satan is wise. He understands the sinful nature of man. So he goes to Eve and alludes to her sinful nature. Remember the lusts of the world, or the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now we know this serpent in the Old Testament was Satan. Revelation 20, verse 2, he laid hold on that dragon, on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So that's Satan's origin. Let's get on to now. Now, what is Satan? We saw in Ezekiel 28 that Satan was the anointed cherub. Now, a lot of people believe that Satan is a fallen angel. Now, I don't believe that. I don't believe Satan is an angel because the Bible makes it very clear that he is a cherub. And an angel is not a cherub. So angels always look like men. The Bible talks about their, in Hebrews that they are ministering spirits. So angels are like God's servants. And even, you know, believers that are in heaven, you know, can sometimes be called angels as well because they're servants of God as well. So if you remember the angel that took 
um, John around in Revelation, he says, you know, I'm like you know, one, like one like you. So it's actually, you know, angels can refer to people as well that are, are in heaven. But then you have actual angels that are ministering spirits that go throughout the earth, uh, which are not uh, believers. But the thing is, angels always look like men in the Bible. So you never get women angels, and you never get angels with wings. Right? Because what's the confusion there? The reason why people think angels have wings is because they assume that cherubs are angels. And then they assume that Satan is an angel, right? He's a cherub, so then they always picture the angels with wings. But that's not the case. Hebrews 13, 2. It says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Now, you remember that movie, Michael, with John Travolta? And he was supposedly an angel that's like wandering the earth. And, you know, I can't remember. I think he was like an... I don't know. I, I never watched the movie. But I think it was like an angel and he, he wasn't very he wasn't very godly. I think he like drank and smoked or something like that. But notice like he's walking around. He's just got these huge eagle's wings on his back. And you think like, well, of course, that guy's an angel. Because he's got these huge, massive eagle's wings. That's why that's... If you knew you were entertaining an angel because they just had huge wings on their back, then that wouldn't be what this is saying. Right? Hebrews 13, 2 is saying, you don't always know when you're entertaining an angel. But why? Because they look exactly like human beings. They look exactly like men. And in the Bible, every time you saw an angel, they always look like men. Right? And then they realized that they were an angel of the Lord. Now, Satan is not an angel. Right? Now, Satan deceived a lot of the angels to follow him, and they make up all of the devils and the demons that wanted this. So he has angels that are part of his you know crew but he himself is not an angel what is he he is an anointed cherub like we read in ezekiel 28 14 thou art the anointed cherub that covereth now what are these cherubs that cover it in is in exodus 25 when moses created the ark of the covenant You'll remember that when he made the mercy seat of gold, there were these two creatures that covered the mercy seat with their wings. They were cherubims. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. So this is the instruction given to Moses. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. Something that's interesting about just the, the, the gold, I don't even realize how he heavy gold is. Um, that they, they move gold, they're moving them on these like industrial pallets. But then you look at the amount of gold that's on that pallet and it's like this small pile. Have you ever seen those, those videos on TikTok and whatnot on, on YouTube and Facebook where the person's trying to pick up that bar of gold and they're trying to pull it through the, the hole in the plastic and if you can pull it out, it's kind of you win a prize. And you see that bar of gold, it's like only this big, but it's so heavy. Now, sometimes people think of the Ark of the Covenant as just these huge creatures, or even the, you know, the golden calf, how they show you like these images of the golden calf and it's just this huge calf on this, you know, carried on the shoulder. But I don't think it was humongous. First of all, gold is extremely expensive. So it's very rare, so there's not a lot of it. But even if they made like a golden calf that was maybe like this big, it would still require a lot of people to carry that because it's so heavy, this metal. So if you imagine the mercy seat on the car, Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant's not that big. And these cherubims don't have to be very big for it to be quite heavy, right? Because they're made of pure gold, just like the mercy seat is made of pure gold. Of beaten work shalt thou make them. So notice how they're, they're pure gold, the, the mercy seat and the cherubims. It's not just gold plated. But some of the other stuff was gold-plated, like the actual ark itself and the, and the poles that carried it, in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end and one cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. So the mercy seat represents the throne of God, and there were two cherubs on either side covering the mercy seat. Now some, some uh, ark of the covenants are pictured where the cherubims are like this, and that's... I, th I think that's probably more accurate, but I think in the temple, they're, they're, sometimes they're like this as well. So I think when Solomon made the cherubims in the temple, they were like this, but I think their wings actually covered the mercy seat like this. 
So that represents God's throne in heaven. There was the mercy seat, and there were the two creatures on either side of the mercy seat covering the, the mercy seat. That's why it's the anointed cherub that cover it. So who was Satan? A lot of people believe because of these verses, Satan was actually one of those two cherubs. So can you believe that? You are a creature that's so exalted that you are on the right hand or the left hand of God's throne, covering, you are right next to God. And that's the sad thing, that, you know, he was a creature right next to God, and yet his pride got the better of him. He didn't, he didn't want to be second fiddle to God. He wanted to be the one actually sitting on the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. That's the tables of uh, the two tablets. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things, which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So Satan is one of those cherubs, right? So I won't, I won't uh, maybe I'll skip over First Kings, but this is the temple where Solomon also builds cherubim. But like I said, I think uh, on the Ark of the Covenant they're like this, but in the temple it sounds like they're like this because when it describes it, it says their wings stretch from wall to wall. So they may actually look like this, which is I think how they're pictured in most um, temple cherubims. Let's move on. Now, these creatures, just as a point of interest, are different to the creatures that are flying in Revelation with six wings, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. So notice that people assume those are angels flying, saying, Holy, holy, holy. But remember, you have angels that look like men, you have cherub that have two wings, and then you have these beasts in Revelation that have six wings, right? So it describes them a bit says in verse 8, six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So that's where we get the song, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Now in Isaiah 6, we get the names of these creatures. Isaiah 6, 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So that lines up with Revelation 4. So that is not what a cherubim is. You've got cherubs. So, sorry, not what a cherub is. So you've got the seraphs. You got the cherubs, and then you got the angels. The got a, angels, angel, cherub, and seraph. And then the plural is angels, cherubim, seraphim. Right? So that's what Satan is. Satan is not an angel, but he is a created being, has a beginning, like we said, but he's not an angel, he is a cherub. Now let's talk about where Satan is. <coughs> Where Satan is. So we know that Satan is not like God. He can't be everywhere at once because he's not omnipresent. He's a created being that is in one place at once. Now, can he move around the place? Maybe he can move around really quickly, but he's only in one place at once. Now, where he is not, he is not in hell. See, a lot of people think Satan is in hell, like he's ruling and reigning in hell. No, hell was created to not only punish those that do not believe on Jesus Christ because the wages of sin is death, but it was created also to punish the angels and the devil, those that sin against God. Look at what it says here in Matthew 25, 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Look, prepared for the devil and his angels. So Hell is not a kingdom of Satan. Hell is not a place where Satan rules from. Hell is a place of punishment. It's God's place of punishment. And Satan one day will be thrown there as well with his angels. Isaiah 14 is a prophecy of Satan being cast into hell. 
Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the, up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee. This is like Ezekiel 28. Art thou also become weak as we? Remember he says, hey, if people are going to look at you, you're going to die like a man. Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. You see, this is Satan going down. So again, Isaiah 14 is about a prophecy about a king, but it's, it's talking about Satan. <laughs> How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground that didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, you see, this pride, his, his music, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. You see how he wanted to be like God? Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms. That is the one thing about hell, is that it will humble the greatest men of earth. Like sometimes we see the men today, you know, whether it's you know, rich men, powerful men, they will be brought down to nothing when they go to hell, just like Satan will be brought down to nothing. And people will say of those people in hell, is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms gosh doesn't that strike some fear of god into you you know that that this is what god does you, we see the most powerful and most influential men in the earth and yet this is what god is going to do to them not only to them but also to satan so satan is not ruling and reigning in hell and this is why i talk about matthew 16 18 when it talks about jesus says i will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it there is no kingdom ruling in hell where believers are now going to like storm the gates of hell like it's some kingdom that we're taking over no this is talking about the gates of hell shall not prevail against it because nothing is going to come out of hell just like when satan is bound and cast into hell he's not coming out right and this is why jesus goes to hell but it's saying the gates of hell won't prevail against jesus because jesus did come out of hell he resurrected that's what this is talking about in matthew 16. so it's not some kingdom in hell that we're going towards no no so <clears throat> let's keep talking about satan's location now first peter 5 8 says be sober be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may de devour so we know he's not in hell but we know he's walking about the earth right so he goes about seeing who he may devour who he may devour so it's interesting that he is likened unto a lion trying to get prey. And if you've seen the, uh, you know, the documentaries, you know, we all love to see the documentaries, whenever you see an animal attacking another animal, they're all the, they're all the videos that get like millions and millions of views. You know, I'm sure you've clicked on one where it's like, tiger goes up against this, and you're like, ooh, I want to see this. So he's like a lion, and you know the way the lions operate, they wait for one of the herd, the weaker herd, to stray from the herd, don't they? So the, the younger one, baby strays from the herd. The lions don't go after the adults, like the adult wildebeest. Why? Because the adult's going to like stab him underfoot. No, no, it goes for the younger ones, and not just the younger ones that are like part of the flock, it goes after the younger ones that stray from the flock. So how do you protect yourself? You say you worry about Satan. You just stay amongst the flock, right? Because it's the younger ones, think about it, the younger Christians, the babes in Christ, that start getting out of church, getting away from the body of Christ, thinking, you know, it's, it doesn't matter so much if I skip church every now and then. Then it's skipping church once, you know, once a month, skipping church twice a month, haven't gone to church for a month until you're out right you've gone unto satan that's who he's seeking whom he made devour. he's trying to bring the world think about his allure his allure is the world and this is why people get out of church because of the cares of this world 
Job 1. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. So this is another thing that people don't know about Satan, is that Satan is able to freely travel between heaven and earth. You say, like, well, hasn't Satan been cast out of heaven? No, that has not happened yet. Right? That happens in the future. Right? So Satan gets cast out of heaven in the future, but until then, he is able to walk to and fro between the earth. So let's look at that. And we might end it there because I'm kind of going a bit over time. I don't want to spend too much time <coughs> today. But let's look at Satan being cast out of heaven. Right? So a lot of people, like I said, they believe the fall of Satan is when he's cast out of heaven. No. So when we refer, you know, I still use the term the fall of Satan, but I'm referring to the fact that he was perfect and then he sinned, like the fall of man. Right? The fall of man, he was perfect and then he sinned. Right? But he has not yet been cast out of heaven. In Job, we see here, when he comes before God, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan's there as well. Now, where is God? God's throne is in heaven. So Satan is able to go to heaven, right? And he's able to go to and fro between seeing the earth. So this is where people get a bit mixed up because they think, well, isn't heaven where we go when we're like sinless? You know? And that's, that's true because us as men, we can't travel we're not a spiritual creature like a cherub and, and these angels that can travel between heaven and earth so the only right way we go to heaven is that we die and our soul our spirit is alive then we're able to go into heaven ascend into heaven like jesus ascended into heaven but not these creatures these creatures can go in and out so so you just have to understand that it's not that heaven is a place that's, that doesn't have any sin Heaven is right now just a place where God rules and reigns. The only way we can get there is if we die and we're sinless and we go to heaven. But there are creatures like Satan that are able to go between heaven and earth. And we see here in Job 1.12, the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now there will be a day when, you know, they are cast out of heaven, and then heaven is only a place that is sinless. And then obviously the new heaven and the new earth is a place that has no sin as well. So let's look at the actual casting out of Satan into the earth. We see this in Revelation 12, verse 7. And there was a war in heaven. <coughs> there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and his angels fought, uh, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. So this is the event that happens where Satan is cast out of heaven. There is a war that happens, right? So obviously it hasn't happened yet, because you know, he's still in Job, he's going back and forth and whatnot. So in Revelation, this is talking about end times events. It's something that's going to happen in the future. There's a war in heaven. Then he loses that war. Then he's cast out into the earth. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So this is now, they're able to travel between earth and heaven, but this is now they're no longer able to go back to heaven now, because now they're cast out. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So you see how he was in heaven saying bad things against the believers, accusing them day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So what is actually happening here? This is now the beginning 
of the Great Tribulation. This is what actually kicks off the Great Tribulation because there's that war in heaven, Satan is cast out, and then he goes to make war with the saints. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man child. Now, I'm not spending time on the beginning half of Revelation, but you remember there was this woman that was clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And a lot of people believe that that woman is Mary because the devil is there ready to devour the man-child, Jesus Christ. So it's a picture of the birth of Jesus Christ. But I don't actually believe that that woman is Mary. I believe this woman is a picture of Eve. Right? So Eve is being represented here and he, she's representing God's people because all the things that are said in Revelation 12 don't really fit um, Mary. So when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. So this is where some people think, well, that's Eve, right? Because did it, you know, Satan go after them and then they had to go flee. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. So this is talking about the end times, you know, timeline of three and a half years from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood and the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ so this is now the start of the tribulation and we're not spending too much time there but that that is the mo that is the time where Satan is cast out. So that hasn't happened yet. That's going to happen in the future. Revelation 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So during the thousand year reign, we're talking about where is Satan? Well, Satan's not ruling in hell. Satan is able to walk between heaven and earth. Satan has not even gone to hell yet. This is when Satan goes to hell. He is cast out of heaven, Revelation 12. Revelation 20 talks about when Satan actually goes to hell for the first time. And this is just prior to the thousand year reign. Cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So isn't that interesting that prior to the thousand year reign, he's cast into hell, but he knows he's going to let him out one more time to deceive the nations one more time, right? Because there's still people that are getting saved through the millennial kingdom. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast neither his image neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished this is the first resurrection so now the thousand year reign has passed right so there's a millennial kingdom where Jesus rules and reigns for a thousand years but it's described in Revelation 20 very quickly. A thousand years is over. And that's the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So there's this rebellion that is building up over the thousand-year reign of people that do not want to submit to Jesus Christ's rule. You say, is that us? No, because we've already been resurrected. We're perfect. We're ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. But it's who we're ruling and reigning over. People are still multiplying. People are still getting married in the millennial kingdom. People are getting saved. People still don't want to be saved. 
So Satan comes out after the thousand year reign, gathers this final rebellion. They go up to the holy city where Jesus is ruling and reigning, but then they are just all destroyed like a nuclear bomb, right? Just all taken out, and that's the end. That's the final rebellion. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So that is when Satan goes to hell. Now, I'll just end it there because, you know, I did have a bit more to talk about with Satan's character, but I think I'll save it till the next sermon. So in conclusion, where did we start? 2 Corinthians 2. It says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So there's many misconceptions about Satan. Hopefully you've learned a bit more tonight and um, you know, not so ignorant about Satan. But a few things. You know, we don't want to be ignorant about Satan, but we don't want to be ignorant as well of his desire to destroy your faith. Remember, he's, he's walking about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And it's whom he may devour because... When Satan comes after you, it's because you have strayed from the path, right? You have strayed from the flock. That's why he's able to get you. And you can see that that analogy plays out with the way our heart and with worldliness, right? As people become more worldly and their love for God grows cold, they start to get away from the things of God. And that's when Satan can come and use the allure of worldliness to keep you away from God's people and from the flock so don't be ignorant of satan don't be ignorant of his desire to destroy your faith don't be ignorant of the way he operates and you know god forbid don't ignorantly help satan you know god forbid that you know christians already struggle to live for god it's easy to backslide you know but god forbid christians would help the cause of satan you know, and love the world more than they love God and their worldliness be, you know, infectious on others. And then, you know, Satan doesn't even have to do a work. You know, it doesn't even have to attack because Christians who are worldly will attack it themselves, right? So don't be ignorant about Satan. Don't be ignorant about his desire to want to destroy your faith, to infect you with worldliness. But don't you be worldly and do the job of Satan. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for um, your word and, and thank you for the teaching today. We pray, Lord, that your word will resonate in our hearts, uh, that, Lord, it will help us to stay with the flock, stay close to you, stay close to your word. Lord, we don't want to be ignorant of Satan, and, Lord, we don't want to help Satan in his work. So we pray, Lord, that you will help us be faithful, faithful to you, faithful to your cause, faithful to your battle, so we are on the side of right. We thank you, we praise you, in Jesus' name, amen.